Well, right now I am in the French town of Amfreville in Normandy. And this is a monument to the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which is attached to the 82nd Airborne on D-Day. Now this is, this is a spot that typically doesn't get visited on tours, but in here, in this general area, is where the men of the 82nd landed on D-Day. And today, we are going to go to a spot close by here that has become legendary in the history of the 82nd Airborne. Well, I mentioned that we were going to go to a place that is legendary in the history of the 82nd Airborne, and I have never been here before, and I am so excited. This right here is Lafayette Bridge, which was one of the most crucial objectives on D-Day. And uh, we're, we're going to, to take a little time to, to explore this area and kind of break down what happened right here in 1944. Okay, so uh, I'm not the only one here uh, at Lafayette today. I got Eric Dorr with me. He's not allowed to be on camera because he's wearing a 101st Airborne shirt and uh, this is an 82nd Airborne site. We don't want to make anybody mad, but I do have Paul Woodage from World War II TV. They actually did an episode here and, and had a, a really good treatment that is really in depth on the attack uh, or the battle here at Lafayette. So he's gonna kind of walk us through some of what happened here on D-Day. Uh, correction, Paul just told me that there were a couple of 101st Airborne guys here that, that I didn't know about and not many people know about. So here, here's our cameo uh, <laughs> with our 101st Airborne representation uh, on the Lafayette video. <laughs> I wanted to, to jump up here to, to really give you a commanding view of what this area looks like. So in 1944, this whole valley that we're looking at now would have been flooded by the Germans. And right there in the distance is the Lafayette Bridge. And they've done something really amazing here to help us uh, to, help us to interpret this battle. Uh, they have this bronze sculpture that is super detailed and uh, in addition to the artistic value has a lot of informational value as well. So right here on this part of the map they're showing the the route that the 82nd Airborne took in here and uh, round about where they landed. You're going to have the, the 7th Corps moving up in this direction and the whole objective with this part of the the Allied forces is to cut the Cotentin Peninsula off from the Germans and then move up right here to the deep water port at Cherbourg. Now, as I mentioned, all of this is flooded and there are two bridges right here in this area that the allies are going to need in order to push uh, to, to the west here and, and cut off this peninsula. One was at Chef du Pont and the other one was right here at Lafayette. Through much of the morning of June the 6th, James Gavin and men of the 505th, notably 1st Battalion and A Company guys, have dug in around where we're standing, enduring quite a formidable artillery barrage from the other side of the Murderay River. A couple of senior, senior officers, Major Kellum was killed here, 
but the real um, events began sometime like three o'clock in the afternoon when one of the American paratroopers up on the high ground where the Iron Mike statue sits today saw at the other end of the causeway about 600 yards away uh, three German tanks approaching and for paratroopers lightly equipped even if you've got bazookas enemy tanks are a real danger and these three tanks are being followed by two or three hundred German infantry coming towards us and where we are maybe 120, 150 paratroopers. But luckily there are two bazooka teams, two two-man bazooka teams over the other side of the road are Balderson and Prine. And where we are here, uh, Marcus Heim from Pennsylvania was the loader and the firer was Lennel Peterson, a Swede from Minnesota. And their foxhole was just where that stone slab is down there. And they dug themselves into a foxhole so they're a bit safe from the artillery bombardment. But unfortunately, how low they were in the foxhole, there was no line of sight to the road where these tanks are coming. Now, uh, the A Company guys, a shout, John Dolan, A Company commander, shouts to these bazooka guys, don't fire until all three German tanks have come around the very distinctive bend in the road we can see over there. Because if you fire too early, there'll be a tank behind that bend firing this way that's too far away for the Americans to engage but still endangering American personnel so they had to wait for all three tanks to get around the corner. First was a Panzer III, the second two were Renaults. Now by the time the third German tank had got around the corner the first tank is pretty much on the bridge. It's just a few yards at the the bridge. Heim and Peterson jump out of their foxhole back up the grass slope to pretty much where we're standing and from here is where they fire the bazooka at the first German tank. And at where we are now this is about the maximum range you'd want to be firing a bazooka to accurately hit a German armor. Now it's a, it's a Panzer III, it's, it's not too big. They fire the first bazooka round there, bang, it hits the tank. They run up the slope here, fire another couple of shells at the first tank, definitely knocking it out. Meanwhile, another American paratrooper runs up from over here, jumps on the top of the, the tank, pulls open the turret hatch, drops a grenade in, that's the Germans in that tank are definitely dead two tanks still lumbering towards them. Hyman Peterson now use the first knocked out Panzer III as cover, fire their bazooka at the second tank, bang, that hits the second tank, that is halted. There's still a third tank coming towards them. Problem now is Marcus Heim has, has used, he's the loader, the six uh, bazooka rounds he had. Damn! He runs across the other side of the road. Balderson and Prine had been firing, but their position wasn't quite as good to get an angle on the road. They've now been wounded, an explosion has occurred, they've been walking backwards, there's apparently blood pouring out of their ears where they're kind of concussed by this. So they're out of the picture but they've left three spare bazooka rounds on the, gra on the ra ground. Marcus Heim picks up the three remaining bazooka rounds, runs back on the bridge and from somewhere near tank number two they fire at tank number four, bang, knock it out, the third tank is knocked out. All this with a couple of hundred German infantry on the road behind, all laying fire down this way, all the Americans in these buildings laying fire down this way. The Germans are stopped in their attempt to get across the bridge, they fall back the other side of the road. They don't give up though, twice more on D-Day, Germans attempt to push their way back in here, more vehicles, another tank gets knocked out later on. But at no point during the defence of this bridge on June the 6th did an armed German soldier ever cross this bridge from the western direction this position holds firm and ultimately the four bazooka men were all to receive the distinguished service cross the only time in the USA's history where four men from the same company have received the distinguished service cross for the same action on the same day uh, Marcus Hyman and Peterson received theirs at the same ceremony uh, that um, Robert Ray who earned his for the side of the causeway charge um, Edward Cannonball Krause, command, uh, commander of 2nd Battalion 505th, received his medal in the same famous photo taken at La Hida Puy. And uh, the other two who were wounded got their medals later on. But an amazing story of heroic defence here, where these four men received that medal for that incredible act of bravery here.
All right, I've moved down to the general location of where the foxhole for Heim and Peterson would have been. And whenever you get down here, Paul talked about how they didn't have a good line of sight of that bend in the road. Well, keep in mind, I'm standing on, you know, top of the ground. I'm not in a foxhole and uh, you can't see anything from here. Uh, and also, if you look there in the distance at that white pole, well, on D-Day, the, the water line would have been at approximately the top of that pole. So here's a, a really good kind of ground level view of what this bazooka team would have been looking at on D-Day. All right, I'm going to include something in here simply because if I don't, people are going to call me out and ask why I didn't. Uh, there is a little dugout spot right here that claims to be the foxhole of General James Gavin. And I uh, heard the story that uh, somebody asked General Gavin one time if this was actually his foxhole, and he replied that he may have urinated in it once. So uh, maybe this is his foxhole, maybe it's not. Uh, we don't know for sure. All right, anyway, going back down here to the bridge. I've uh, moved across the river now because anywhere I go, I like to look at the perspectives of all players involved. So in this case, the Germans and the Americans. So right here is that bend in the road that Paul was talking about. And uh, right here is the view that they would have had as they were rounding this bend and moving in towards the guys from the 82nd Airborne. So there would have been a lot of bullets flying back and forth right here in this spot during the Battle for Lafayette Bridge. Gosh, this is so amazing to be here. All right, now we can't come to Lafayette without paying a visit to uh, Iron Mike. So Iron Mike is kind of like the, the patron saint of the American paratrooper. And uh, the name comes from a paratrooper who was badly wounded in Sicily and the dude was just tough as nails. So, so Iron Mike kind of embodies the, the toughness of the American paratrooper. And as you can see, he is facing west uh, where he is taking on the, the Germans who are opposing him. Now, also on this monument, they have an etching here that, that honors the memory of General James Gavin, who, as you can see, uh, it's, it's written here that he forever embodied himself as the heart and soul of the 82nd Airborne Division. Just an amazing guy. If we go over here, uh, you can see that it tells a little bit about the battle for the Lafayette bridgehead. Uh, th this was called one of the most hotly contested pieces of ground in World War II by uh, Army hist historian S.L.A. Marshall. Uh, and, and people, I, I think, really don't have a full appreciation for how pivotal this battle was. Uh, it, cutting off uh, the, the Cotentin Peninsula and, and moving in on Cherbourg hinged on seizing this causeway. Like this road became a major artery for the U.S. 7th Corps as they were getting into the peninsula. And, and you can see some of the, the stats here about the 82nd Airborne in Normandy. Uh, about 600 casualties were sustained just taking this causeway. We only told a few of the stories of what happened here, but, but this was just an amazing engagement that was pivotal to the success of the Battle of Normandy. All right, well that was just a little bit on the fight here at Lafayette Bridge. I am so glad that we came here today because this is a spot that I've been wanting to visit for a long time now. Uh, one thing that is, is interesting to note is the, the four men who were on the bazooka team that, that did so much to protect this bridge, they were actually 
draftees. So as I've said before, World War II is filled with all kinds of stories of ordinary men who are placed in extraordinary circumstances and accomplish some amazing extraordinary things. It's, it's really an inspiration to me and an inspiration to all of us that uh, you, you don't have to be the, the superhero archetype. Ordinary people can do some pretty amazing things just like what the men of the 82nd did right here at Lafayette Bridge.